Okay, everyone. Well, good evening and welcome. I'm Kristen Kale. I'm the manager here at Midtown Reader, a local independent bookstore here in Tallahassee, Florida. We're so glad to be hosting local Florida author Lauren Groff as we celebrate the release of her new book, Matrix. She is joined this evening by Dale Griegas, the president of the Friends of the Library here in Tallahassee as well. We're blown away by the turnout for this event, especially given the pivot to the virtual setting. And we're so thankful for everyone's efforts. Uh, to get the word out. Uh, we hope everyone's staying safe and healthy during this time, and we are excited to see Lauren one day in person for a paperback release. Uh, before I introduce our guest further, please note that we'll allow some time at the end for discussion uh, for questions from the audience. You can submit questions down in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, um, and we'll review that at the end. If you'd like to purchase a book, you can order it online at midtownreader.com, over the phone at 850-425-2665, or by stopping by our store in person where you'll find signed copies. We offer contactless pickup and delivery anywhere in Tallahassee, and we're also happy to ship books worldwide. I'll be dropping the link in the chat, and so feel free to reach out, reach out to me as well at kristen at midtownreader.com if you have any questions. Uh, we're in partnership tonight with Friends of the Library. If you'd like to become a member or make a donation, please visit leoncountyflorida.gov at Friends of the Library. This link will be in the chat in the well, as well. Uh, Dale has more information about uh, Friends of the Library. If you want to say a little bit about that, Dale. Okay. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Kristen. Um, and thank you to Sally and, and to Midtown Reader and, and to Lauren, of course. Um, the Friends of the Library, our, our primary role is to raise funds and encourage gifts to the library um, for innovative programs and resources. And um, as a result of our fundraising, many types of fundraising over the years, um, we've been able to make some incredible purchases for the library. Uh, these are just a few of them. Um, a bookmobile, uh, telescopes, virtual reality equipment for the main library and all the branches. Uh, special book collections, uh, the Library of Things, which is an innovative collection of non-book items that can be checked out, and annual support for a literacy program um, in the library. Um, we rely very strongly on the um, support of our you know, dues-paying members, and I strongly encourage you to become a member of the Friends of the Library. Um, an individual membership is only $30 um, annually, and if you're 62 or older, um, it's $15 a year. And that's such, a, such an easy way um, to support our beloved library. So, thank you. Thank you so much, Dale. Uh, so with that being said, it is my pleasure to introduce tonight's guests. Lauren Groff is the two-time National Book Award finalist and the New York Times bestselling author of the novels The Monsters of Templeton, Arcadia, and Fates and Furies, and the short story collections Delicate Edible Birds in Florida. She has won the Story Prize and has been a finalist for the National Book Critics Circle Award. Groff's work regularly appears in The New Yorker, The Atlantic, and elsewhere, and she was named one of Grant's 2017 Best Young American Novelists. With Lauren tonight is Dale Griegas. As mentioned, Dale is the president of the Friends of the Library for the Leon County Public Library System. Originally from Long Island, New York, Dale has lived in Tallahassee since attending graduate school at Florida State University. She has held management consulting, research strategic planning, and teaching positions. She has been involved with the Friends of the Library Board for the past four years. In her spare time, Dale loves to spend time with friends and family, take long walks, travel, and of course, read. Her favorite genres are bio and memoir and historical fiction, making her the perfect fit for this conversation. They are here tonight to discuss Lauren's new book, Matrix. Cast out of the royal court by Eleanor of Aquitaine, deemed too coarse and rough hewn for marriage or courtly life, 17-year-old Marie de France is sent to England to be the new prioress of an impoverished abbey, its nuns on the brink of starvation and beset by disease. At first taken aback by the severity of her new life, Marie finds focus in love and collective life with her singular sisters. In this crucible, Marie steadily supplements her desire for family, for her homeland, for the passions of her youth was something new to her. Devotion to her sisters and a conviction in her own divine visions. Marie, the, lost, the last in a long line of women warriors and crusaders, is determined to chart a bold new course for the women she now leads and protects. But in a world that is shifting and corroding in frightening ways, one that can never reconcile itself with her existence, will the sheer force of Marie's vision be bulwark enough? 
Warren, Dale, thank you so much again for being here tonight. And now I'm going to hand it over to you both. Thank you. I have to say, this is such a, a beautiful uh, duality. I love independent bookstores. Midtown Reader is one of my favorites. They used to have a place for writers actually to sleep in the bookstore. And that was like my dream when I was five years old was to sleep in a bookstore next to a cupcake place. Um, and then the library, right? The library is where it's, I think it's the vanguard of democracy. It's where everyone can, um, can, can, reach education, right? They can educate themselves, uh, pull a book down from the shelves and just uh, start to read. And I think that that's the most beautiful thing. And I think we need to protect our libraries too. So uh, thank you, Midtown Reader. Thank you, Dale and the friends of the library. Really appreciate being here. And thank you people. I'm so sorry that I'm not in person. I would like love to throw flowers and jelly beans at you if I could, but I can't. I'm stuck in a Orlando airport's uh, hotel room, alas. Yeah. <laughs> should I keep going or um, should um, we have a go? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, if, if you want to do a quick introduction or if you want me to go right into the quest questions, I'd be glad to oh, do that. I didn't know. So, um, yeah, uh, we could do. I think that um, I think the introduction is pretty good. That's the, the copy on the book. Uh, I'll just give you sort of like a very vague, um, large scale overview of where this book came from. So when I was in college, Amherst College is a tiny little place in Massachusetts. Um, luckily, it's a, it's a place for people like me, like major nerds who don't do well in large crowds. So I, um, I started taking tutorials and uh, one of the tutorials I started taking was uh, in Ancien Francais, which is old French, right, um, in my sophomore year. And I loved it so much, I thought I wanted to be a medievalist. So I, um, I would just read all these old French texts and translate them into English. And then um, I fell in love with this woman and her name was Marie de France. And she was the first known female poet in the French language. Now, we don't know much about Marie de France. We, um, because women at the time, were only interesting to the people who are writing the history of the time if they were related to men, right? It was a relational interest in women. So if they were the daughters of kings, the wives of kings, the mothers of kings, that, that's who was considered interesting enough or important enough to write down the details of their lives. But Marie, we don't know much about her. I mean, historians are arguing still about who she might have been. She may have been an abbess in England, which this is um, a, basically a couple of generations after the Norman conquest. So in England, um, the, the nobility, everyone spoke French. Um, and so she probably was someone from France who came over to England and started writing these, these poems. Um, but we, other people think that she might have been a, an illegitimate daughter of some noble person. Even that she, she might have been uh, Eleanor of Aquitaine's, one of her first uh, brood of children. She was married to two kings. She was married to the king of France and then to the um, king of England. And they think that she might have been her um, Louis Set's um, daughter. Nobody knows. So into this realm, um, I, I was transfixed by this Marie de France figure who was sort of cloaked in mystery and obscurity for years, for decades. Uh, and I wanted to do something with her. And it, nothing struck me as um, real or, um, it, you know, I think when you've written for long enough, there's a bell in your head that goes off when you when you see or sense a good idea, like a rich idea, an idea that can become a novel or a short story. And I didn't get that sense from anything that I had pondered over the years. And then finally, I was at um, uh, Radcliffe Institute's uh, Institute for Advanced Studies, this wonderful place um, up at Harvard. And it's a place where it's just a cross pollination of ideas um, by people in different disciplines, which is so exciting to, again, a nerd like me. So I would sit there and listen to astrophysicists talk about black holes and be like, oh my God, my next novel has to be about a black hole, right? And then I would, I would um, go to like a geologist and, and think the same thing. 
And then I went to my friend Katie Bugis's talk. Uh, she's this um, a scholar who pays attention to medieval nuns. And her, her talk that day was on the liturgies of medieval nuns. And it was so astonishingly beautiful. She loved nuns so much. And she sort of conveyed that love to the audience so that I sat there and I, it's not that I had a vision, but it's almost as if the book sort of announced itself to me whole as I was sitting to her lecture, sitting in her lecture, listening to her talk about these, these daily, um, very rigorous schedule of prayer and work that the nuns um, engaged in. When I thought, oh my gosh, oh, this is amazing. I get to bring in my passion for Marie de France. I get to bring in um, uh, my fascination with utopias because almost every book that I've written has been about some sort of community or failed utopia. And um, I get to think about, and this is the really big thing, I was trying to escape no, not escape, that's the wrong word. I was trying to figure out a way to talk about the contemporary world uh, in such a way that I could actually grasp some part of it. I mean, I think when I when I was sitting there in the audience at Radcliffe listening to Katie Bogus give this brilliant speech, uh, I was so tired of the political world in this country. I was so tired of men yelling at me all my life. I really just wanted... Um, to, to be able to understand what was happening. I mean, I, do, I don't know if you remember, but there were waves upon waves of news crashing over our heads on a daily basis. And it almost felt like we couldn't come up for air. We couldn't breathe. And I just felt I couldn't have enough um, distance on what was happening in the world that I was able to morally engage. But if I were able to do this um, in a historical standpoint from a thousand years ago, and look back at a thousand years ago at the roots of how we got to where we are now and maybe have the, the present and the past speaking to, to each other over the course of a book, maybe that's that's the way that I would engage with the, the contemporary moment by, by sort of framing it in, um, I guess, a millennium of uh, hierarchical structures and, um, I guess missed opportunities. So that's that's Matrix. That's my kind of five minute elevator speech. Uh, is that good? What do you think, that's Dale? Good. Should we do it? Go. That's good. You actually answered a couple of my questions. Okay. You know? <laughs> um, let me ask you this, Lauren. Um, a few years ago, you wrote a book of short stories about the state of Florida, um, and now you've written a feminist novel that takes place in the the twelfth century. Um, how different is the process to prepare for the different types of, of books you write? Well, I mean, everything that I write is feminist, just because feminist means we believe that women are equal to men. That's what it means. Um, so if, if I called myself not a feminist, I'd be very, very sad. <laughs> um, but I think, you know, I mean, love short stories. It was the first fictional form that I fell in love with. I began as a poet way long ago, and a deeply failed poet in every single way. Um, but when I did start getting into fiction, it was through short fiction. And I think poetry and short fiction have very deep resemblances. Even though novels and short fiction are prose, I think the, the way that you build a short story, the way that you um, think about the structure of a short story, I think possibly is more more akin to the to the poem, at least in, in my sense. So um, with a short story, well, okay, I'll erase all that. With a novel, um, really the only way that I know how to get through the writing of a novel, and of course my experience is one experience in a whole panoply of experiences, but I just wake up with it every day, right? It is my daily existence, my exercise, my, um, my meditative practice. It is the thing that I am thinking about when I go to the grocery store, when I go for my runs, when I yell at my children, all of these things go into the novel. <laughs> Everything goes into the novel. It is, um, it is my partner and it is the way that I feel less alone in the world, to be honest, to have a novel constantly simmering or two uh, constantly simmering inside me. That is, that is, I am, I am, I am plural, right? Mm -hmm. 
Um, but a short story for me is like a burst of passion. And I think a lot of times I'll have an idea and most of my ideas come from something I've read or seen or experienced like a, a fraught emotional moment perhaps that I'm not ready to deal with at the moment that it comes to me. So I just throw it back. I think maybe some people have heard me say this before here, but you throw it back into the, um, into the, the, the sat, you know, the series of satellites sort of orbiting your head and you've got <laughs> many, many ideas orbiting your head at all times. Um, and then you wait and you, and as you wait and as the years or decades sometimes click by, um, that idea grows more dense and more complicated and more interesting. And one day, this density, this gravity that it's taken on from just floating around there um, will collide with another idea and it'll become a short story. And at that point, I know it's a short story if I can't think about the novel, I can only think about the short story. Um, but it took a great number of years to get to the point where I was able to do that, right? Mm -hmm. To sort of have the patience to let the story develop on its own and, and hit another idea and become its own thing. And there are times when I despair, right? There are times like this past year when I've only, you know, I only wrote two stories last year. That's it, two. Uh, <laughs> and that breaks my heart because it's actually, you know, I think um, the joy I get from short stories is such sharp and piercing and profound joy. And the joy I get from a novel is like the joy of a very long marriage, right? Which is, you know, it's nice. It's warm. <laughs> it's love, but it's also, you know, it's nice. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Um, one thing that really stood out to me, Lauren, as I read Matrix, was how well Marie, um, the main character, is developed. I mean, you just did an incredible job of, of developing that, that character. And as you mentioned earlier, um, very little is known about the real Marie de France. Um, one article that I read stated that um, the details of Marie's life are ambigu ambiguous, hotly contested, and above all, quite sca scarce. <laughs> so um, can you just tell me just a little bit more about kind of what went into developing her character? I mean, you obviously had a lot of latitude because so little really was known about her, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So the first thing I did, because I was actually a little bit daunted at the beginning by by trying to write into a character about which we actually know very little, right? I, I mean, it was a little bit easier to write about Eleanor Bacotin because you get glimpses of her voice, right? You see, I mean, some of her letters are still extant. And so you can see when she grows very imperious and she did grow very imperious, she had wrath. <laughs> she was a woman of wrath and I love her. Um, but Marie, we only know her basically through her work, right? So, so that's what I started with. I started with, um, the two books that I know for, I feel she actually wrote were the lay, right? The, the poems that, um, are these fantastical stories. Uh, I really love them very, very much, but also fables. And yeah, actually some historians contest that she actually wrote them, but I don't, I'm not listening to those historians. <laughs> I pretend that they're not actually speaking to me. Um, so I took these two works that I knew fairly well for the past two decades, and I sat down with them, and I built a a, um, a list of 100 to 150 images or ideas that came out of them, um, and and I then I sort of compressed this list into basically a prose poem. And I looked at the prose poem and I built my biography of this fictionalized person out of this prose poem. So if one were a, a scholar of Marie de France or had like a very good knowledge of the lay and the fables and um, went back into the book, they could see, I think they would be able to see sort of the skeleton of um, her work. It was a reverse engineering of life uh, out of the work, which I know, I think it's a biographical fallacy. I think we're not allowed to do it, but I'm doing it anyway, because it's the only thing I could do. And then in order to sort of speak about things that I felt I so passionately needed to speak about, like um, ideas of female power and, and how it, um, how power itself 
and the the desire to grow like the um proto capitalism um is kind of a destructive force right so in order to to sort of talk about things like that i needed my character of marie to be so strong-willed right and so distinctive and almost um in some ways to, to take on herself the attributes of a lot of the men at the time and we know just historically we, you know i mean gender is socially like placed upon people um and I, there have always been women who have just refused people born as women as um female who've just refused these gender roles and have chosen for themselves to do other things. And this is something that Marie, in some ways, uh, she she rejects a lot of the, the ways that she's supposed to act. Um, she loves sword fighting, right? She's, she has a tough, she likes to swear, right? She's very rude, um, she's rough. Um, she will walk into a room and then challenge uh, a young and like, you know, um, weakling little scholar to a, like a disputation, which at the time was the way that um, conversations about spirituality happened, these disputations, and Marie would come in blaring and fierce, and a woman, and, you know, scholars would, you know, shrivel to the ground, um, in my vision of who this person was. So she was someone who rejected a lot of the gender roles um, imposed upon women at the time, and uh, some, in some ways because uh, she was raised outside of society, and she was raised by um, it's almost like benign neglect in some ways, but right, raised by this this cadre of kind of strong, interesting ants who all went on the crusade, the second crusade. Okay. Uh, is any of your character development autobiographical in nature? In other <laughs> words, how much of you do we see in Marie? <laughs> <laughs> about it. She does not like to be told what to do. These are all things that come directly from my understanding of my own personality. <laughs> and I think uh, when you write fiction, I think fiction sometimes is a misnomer, right? Because it gives the audience the feeling that uh, everything is just made up, but nothing is made up in fiction, right? Everything has to come from somewhere. And I think um, when when fiction feels true to you as a writer, and one would hope eventually to the reader, it's because it comes out of a place of just profound honesty and um, almost vulnerability at a very deep level, right? So you can't hide from the truth when you're writing fiction. You have to just engage and then if you feel yourself shying away, that's an indication that you actually have to stop and stay and go deeper. Um, and, and often the moments that don't strike the reader as um, true or as good or as right are the moments where the, the writer definitely got timid um, and, and backed away and, and um, refuse to actually look at the the abyss <laughs> gaze into the abyss <laughs> so i think yeah i think um i think i'm more truthful when i write fiction 
than I am when I write nonfiction, even if everything in the nonfiction is verifiable fact. Um, I think the, the fiction has to um, come up to a higher standard of uh, just a higher moral standard to me. Yeah. This is also why I don't write a lot of nonfiction. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, I know you mentioned that you you wrote poetry, you know, years and years ago, you know, but did you know at a very early age that you wanted to be a writer? And kind of as a second part to that question, um, what advice would you have for the young writers that are listening in tonight? Because I know we've got um, several creative writing um, students from the FSU um, creative writing program. Um, yeah. Yeah, um, I did, I, you know, I, um, I was, believe it or not, pathologically shy when I was little. I don't think I spoke to anyone outside of my family until I was about eight years old. And my teacher finally was like, you need to talk to me, right? I, I need to know you have an actual voice. I think part of that was um, my older brother is, um, he sucks all the oxygen out of the room. He's a lovely, brilliant man, but he knows it. Uh, and he's just like, um, so I never got a chance to talk, uh, and then I didn't know how to. And so I read so many books. And when I was about 12, I started, um, my friend gave me a book of Emily Dickinson and Emily Dickinson, she's so deceptively simple. You start to feel like you maybe you could do it yourself, which is absolutely ludicrous, right? Nobody can do what Emily Dickinson does. She's, she's the American genius in poetry. Other than, I mean, Walt Whitman's great. Um, but um, so I started writing poetry and I wrote poetry in secret and in private. It was very much a private, um, almost a fervency. It was almost a prayer, right? I was praying to myself in a certain way. And um, I think also I was such a big reader, but I only read books from basically our, my Cooperstown, New York library sale. So we would have these summer library sales where you'd buy, um, you know, four for a dollar uh silverfish tomes that were sort of flaky and smelled of the 19th century and i would bring those home because a lot of my reading back then was very aspirational i wanted to be smarter than i was i wanted to know more than i was so i'd you know sit down with these crumbling like trollop books and not understand a single thing and, and um and then i finally got to college and then i tried to take some poetry courses nobody let me i was terrible and then um, I, just, I got into a fiction class and started reading contemporary fiction. It was my first exposure to contemporary fiction. All of my literature classes up to that point had been, you know, medieval French, or um, I think it was my the most contemporary class I had taken up to my junior year was, uh, I think, it. I think Sylvia Plath was the youngest person that we read. <laughs> I mean, yeah. um, so finally, you know, in this fiction class, I get this course packet and it's these genius women, not that far off of my age, right? It's, it's Laurie Moore, it's Amy Hempel, it's Joy Williams, it's Grace Paley. It's these people who are still living and breathing. And I can see the world through their eyes and I understand and know it a little bit better. And suddenly it actually occurred to me then that not only did had I wanted to be a writer all along, it was actually not an impossible thing to be. Um, I had never actually met a writer until I took that class and with with an actual published writer. And that was so moving, right? It was a, it was a moving moment where um, my sort of disbelief that this was something that one could do became um, an actual possibility, right? It was the thing that I, I could do for the rest of my life. And that's all I wanted to do for the rest of my life. So, um, and my piece of advice is the, I don't believe in advice. <laughs> I don't, no, no, I do. Uh, I, I don't think that you can extricate advice from the work at hand, right? So everything that, if, I think everything that um, a writer needs to work on actually is in the thing that they're struggling with at the moment. But I do have to say, this is something that I have to remind myself almost every single day. Um, and I do very frequently. And it is that um, what we do uh, when we write, um, it should be pure joy, right? It's play, it's not work. We're not, so we're, you know, I, 
today in my car, I was coming home from trying to play tennis this morning and I got stuck behind a recycling truck and these guys, very buff guys, were jumping off and throwing the recycling into the recycling truck. And they'd been doing this for hours and they were sweaty and they were covered in like recycling juice. And I looked at them and I was like, that is work. What I do is not work. What I do is just, it should be pure joy. It should be play. And if it's not, it's the, it's the work telling you something about the work. So always look for the source of heat, the source of light, the source of joy in the work. Go there and know that that is what you need to, to, to replicate, to think about, to expand, um, and try to bring into the places that feel dark, obscure, sad, difficult, right? So, so just remember that what we're doing is just, it's beautiful. It's, it's mm-hmm. art is beautiful. And um, doesn't mean that it's not serious, doesn't mean that it's not difficult. But um, if you keep in mind that it's also ecstatic at the same time, that will make our lives as artists much easier and longer, I think. I think the reason why people stop making art is because um, we lose sight of that fact, the fact that it is play, it is joy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I love that. <laughs> okay. I love that whole concept of, of it, it being pure, uh, pure joy. Um, okay, uh, let me see. Given your amazing success um, as a young writer, um, so many acc- accolades and awards, um, how much pressure do you feel each time you start a new book? Well, okay. <laughs> That's very sweet. I think it's, it's um, this is another truth. I'm like spilling all my truths tonight. Uh, but I think um, it's a very rare person who sits on her laurels or uh, who actually values her laurels <laughs> at all. Uh, I think the target shifts, right? And you're always, I don't think I ever meditate on anything great that's happened. I'm always looking at the work at hand. I'm trying to figure it out, right? Because I think it's all lovely, right? But but I think in order to survive an artistic life at a certain point, um, there needs to be a dissociation in as gentle a way as possible between the artist and the persona. Um, and the persona is the person talking to you tonight. Um, I'm the person who like is trying to make sure her book is doing as well as possible. Um, I'm the one, right, um, that, that person is out here in the world, but the real person is actually sitting and trying to think about the novel. Um, and I think it's really helpful and really good to have a very distinctive split like this. Uh, because if you don't, you could very, very easily take both um, critique and um, I guess the opposite of critique love as, um, as statements about who you are as a person. And I think that's deadly to the to author. I don't, I don't think anyone should have their ego tied up in um, the way that work is received at all. And I know that's really impossible. I mean, it's like the hardest possible thing to do, but if there is a bifurcation, if there's a split, if if you're able to keep those two things separate, then it's much, much easier. And that means that the artist has some great liberty to do what she needs to do, which means for me, I fail um, 98% of the time, right? Um, I work every single day. I was working when I was in labor with both of my children. Um, I work, right? Which means like I sit down and I try to try to write for at least an hour. And if I can't write for that hour or can't write very well, then I allow myself to read for the rest of the time allotted to me. Um, but that is failure, right? <laughs> like that is beautiful failure because it's always moving towards something else. I work on multiple things at once. I, right now I'm working on about six things and I can already see that about two of them are just not going to work in the form that I'm I'm playing around with at the moment. And so I'm going to put them to the side and come back to them later, right? Or uh, I will come back to them, they'll come back to me in a different form and I can start over again. All this to say, I think it's very, very essential um, at a certain point to just say, to, to do everything in your 
in your power to protect that vulnerable child who is the one actually creating the work. Um, that, that's that's what I believe. And, and that means for me, creating a persona that will go into the world and protect the artist. I know that sounds bonkers. I'm sorry. No, not at all. Not at all. So, you, you mentioned that you have a few things, but what, what is in the works for you next? That well, you I, can um, tell us about. So when I started Matrix, I was actually finishing another book, which is basically a um, Robinson Crusoe, both of, of a woman at its center. Um, it's set in 1609 Jamestown. And it's, um, but Matrix had to come out first chronologically because this and um, that book and another book that I'm working on at the moment, one of, one of the ones that I'm working on at the moment, they all have a larger language and syntax that they're all sharing. They're very different. I mean, they're stylistically different. I mean, the, the one set in 1609 in Jamestown has um, Shakespearean um, syntax and rhythm to it. Um, because I, I went back to the King James Bible and I went back to Shakespeare in order to get the ear and get the music of the, the text. And so it has this sort of iambic flow to it. Um, and then the one set in the contemporary day is much more contemporary. So, but they all have, are talking to each other under the surface and eventually I want them to be loosely, vaguely paired. <laughs> um, but who knows? I mean, I'm also, I've been working on the same story since college also. I mean, I've been working on um, many other things. Um, I have one project called Time. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll see if time ever comes out or like, it'll be called something else by the time it does come out. Yeah. Well, we look forward to whatever is is your next um, your next project. Thank you. Um, one thing I was thinking about real quick is, is one final question because I see Kristen is back. Um, you know, we were saying Marie was just such an incredibly unique character, um, and I was thinking, you know, if Matrix was ever made into a movie, can you think of an actress? I mean, what actress could could possibly play her? I'm excited about this because actually, um, I don't know if you know the playwright Heidi Schreck, but she did uh, What the Constitution Means to Me. It's this incredible play that won the Pulitzer. She options the book because I fell in love with her. We talked for probably three hours the first time and I was just like, hey, I want to be your friend so you can buy my book. It's fine. I don't care. Um, and she has the most amazing idea. She wants to populate this abbey of nuns with, with people who you might not have thought of at the time. Like she she wants there to be um, like transgender people. And she was thinking of Marie being maybe a transgender a woman. And, you know, it, I got very, very excited when I when I was talking to her about this because that's what my Abbey is to me, right? It's the place that, that keeps safe all of these women who are rejected by the larger society and allows them to be who, who they can be and loves them, right? I went to an abbey in part of my research in uh, Connecticut, it's called Regina Laudis. It's like the most beautiful abbey. Um, and the thing that moved me the most, there's so much that moved me there, but the thing that like made me, it still makes me get missed, I'm very labile, I'm sorry, I'm gonna cry, um, is that um, when nuns, when these, these sisters go into these abbeys of enclosure, full enclosure, um, they're dedicating themselves to the whole, to the community, which means that the community takes care of them, which means that when they're old, when they're sickly, their sisters are the ones, the people that they love are the ones who, who sort of escort them gently into death, right? Mm -hmm. And I think we get away from that in, in our society. I think it's the, the most beautiful thing to be surrounded by people who love you from from the moment you you choose them to the moment you die, right? And and that's what my Abby is in this book. Yeah. That was such a great answer, Lauren. <laughs> Lauren, I, I loved I loved reading your book, and you. um, as a follow up, I I truly enjoyed talking with you and learning more about it. So thank you very very much. Okay. Thank you, Dale. I appreciate that. We have a, a couple of questions um, from our viewers. Uh, this one was emailed in before the event started. It's from Stephanie. Uh, she writes, your writing has such a unique density to prose and a richness in scene, but somehow still manages to shine with clarity and depth. How do you develop this quality? Do you feel it's a matter of writing or a matter of editing? 
Oh, that's such a good question, Stephanie. Right? It, who knows? <laughs> I think I can tell you the way that I write, and I think that that's what lends itself to density. Um, I write longhand, and um, and I do it because it slows my thinking down, and I'm, I access the animal body in a different way. Right? I think when um, when a cursor is blinking, when something's on the screen, it looks, it almost looks finished, right? It, it almost looks as though, you know, the words can't, I mean, they can be changed, but you just erase it. You don't see the, the scars of what it is. But when you're actually sitting there hunched over the paper and you smell the, the paper, you smell the ink, um, it, it's, it's bringing you into the body in a very animal way. Um, and it allows me to be able to see scenes as an animal. And we are all animals, whether or not we want to admit it, right? The way that we get information is through our bodies. Our bodies are, are the way that we first sense the world and, the, and they're so wise and they're so extraordinarily sensitive. Um, so paying attention to that makes you pay attention to the scene. It slows you down. And then after that, I throw everything out after my first draft and I start over again. And what that does is, I think, um, since I did be, start as a poet, I, I love phrases, right? And I love words. And I'm fascinated by certain things that come up and seem very exciting. But not every exciting thing is necessary for this work, right? <laughs> or, or is actually even living. Yeah, exactly, right? So what throwing everything out does is it gets rid of all the stuff that I fell in love with but didn't really wasn't really right for the I'm not like forcing it to work in in the book if it comes back to me it's probably alive right uh, if it doesn't come back to me it's fine it'll come back at some point in some other work um so you did this I did this over and over again and finally when I go to translate my longhand like my eighth full draft onto the computer I cannot read my handwriting, <laughs> which also slows me down. And it makes it, it, I actually got this, still this from Anne Sexton. I read this beautiful biography by um, Diane Middlebrook about Anne Sexton, where she also couldn't really read her own handwriting. And there's this poem, um, something, something rowing toward God. But the first time she read it was running toward God, but rowing is a much more interesting verb, right? And so I think that the that's almost the hands, it's like the Leonard Cohen in Anthem, um, the cracks are the way the light gets in. It's like it's imposing cracks in your work in order to let the light in. Um, it's it's like imposing randomness on, on the work in some ways. So I think it's all of these things all together, it's writing and editing all at once. Absolutely. Uh, Meg writes, I am so, so happy you have written this novel. We have a little literature of women creating our own domains. When I ran a domestic violence and sexual assault center, a city of women invisible to the outside, I kept a copy of Rumor Godin's In This House of Breed on my desk. What were your inspirations for the social worlds of women in addition to the poet Marie? I want to cry. thank you for doing the work that you do. That's so important. Uh -huh. um, so what the first thing, was going and actually being able to witness um, these incredibly brilliant Benedictine nuns in full enclosure. Um, I don't know if you know much about the Benedictines, but um, part of the the rule is uh, for hospitality. So a lot of these these convents and abbeys have a guest house where if you write to the abbess or the um, the uh, why am I forgetting the abbot. <laughs> and you ask to come, they will they will take care of you. They'll let you come and you can stay in peace and quiet and they'll feed you. In this particular abbey, which I love very much, um, there there's a nun who loved cheese making so much they sent her to France to get a PhD in cheese making. Like they're amazing, right? They're amazing. <laughs> they feed you so well. Um, so one thing is just actually trying to experience um, something like a like a small snippet that they let you see of the, the larger community. Another thing, um, the books that I read, let me see, Marriott and Ecstasy by Ron Hansen was a book that I came back to over and I love this book so much. It's about, um, I guess, uh, like a mystic in the 20th century in a, in a convent. Uh, it's such a brilliant, beautiful book. Um, when I, uh, halfway through editing, 
I read Sylvia Townsend Warner's The Corner That Held Them. Um, it's also about medieval nuns. It is bonkers. <laughs> it has no plot. It's amazing. It's an amazing book. Um, I'm trying to think of other ones. I know there are other ones, but they're, you know, sometimes when you're asked about books, they all flee your head. They're, they just like don't want to come out again. Uh, I'll try to come up with a list and send it to the Midtown Reader. I'm sorry, I couldn't come up with more than two. Oh, <laughs> um, Olive asks, when you described your processes for writing novels and stories, I thought of your novella, What's the Time, Mr. Wolf, which I love. Does this novella writing process feel like a burst of passion, like story writing, a daily exercise, like novel writing, or something else? Well, so thank you. Um, I had tried to write that since um, oh my god, uh, at least 10 years. I tried to write a story like that, um, part of, part of that story, and, and nothing worked. And it, I tried to write it as a short story. And then the first time I wrote, um, a full draft of the story, uh, similar to the one that actually came out, uh, it was a short story, but it was almost, it was too compressed. It was, um, I didn't, give it enough space or air. Um, you know, I think, I, all right, take this with a grain of salt. <laughs> I do like to believe that stories and novellas in their final forms are organisms in a certain way, right? They, they, they exist on their own. They, they take in their own oxygen. They take in their own nutrients. You just have to sort of figure out how to, to make them work that way. Um, and so if you're looking at something that's not quite working and it's not quite working because it feels too compressed, too condensed, I think rewriting it to be, to take up the space that it requires in the world is, is a beautiful exercise in um, freedom and feminism maybe. <laughs> like, why, why shove this story that, that needs to be bigger into like, socially mandated like 3,000 words. Um, and actually when I sent it to the America, it was uh, 23,000 words. And um, they laughed at me and they're like, ha ha, <laughs> we're never gonna do it. And then when it, it did publish it, it was only, I mean, it was online is great, right? But it, it would never have been in the actual physical magazine. They just would never have done that for, for me. <laughs> Els Monroe, yes, <laughs> they know. <laughs> Mags and stuff are it's always fun to have that little bit of leeway but you know it's always fun to figure out the publication of those <laughs> uh, so sarah asked laura and i'm so excited about this book can you talk a little about utopias and community and the ways you keep returning to them yeah so um i thought for sure i wasn't going to do that for this for for the next book that was coming out into the world and the next book is like a utopia of one <laughs> um but I don't, I'm not sure what it is. I think it's because I came from a very tiny village. My, my hometown is Cooperstown, New York, which is the, where the Baseball Hall of Fame is. Uh, but there are under 2,000 people. And uh, it's really kind of isolated, right? It's, um, it's, it's on a lake. There aren't that many towns around. It's very cold in the winter. There's basically one, one road out, maybe two, if you're lucky. Um, and everyone knows all your secrets, right? So like, there are no secrets in this town. Um, and so I was fascinated from birth about, uh, I guess the, the complex social organism that a, a small town is. And then, but also, I think I'm always struggling with um, ideas about how um, we can be better as, as people, right? I think, um, you know, we all live in Florida. Uh, <laughs> I think this is a place where it's basically the battleground of individualism versus community, right? I mean, I, it's never, been so clear as in the pandemic that people um, would rather cling to their own selfishness than, than act for the larger community. And I see this as an increasingly worrisome and um, devastating element of American 
culture. And I think that um, community is losing now. And that makes me extraordinarily sad uh, because we are not going to do the things we need to do in the next 10 to 20 years. We're not going to slow down climate change. We're not going to um, redistribute wealth. We're not going to educate people so they can resist Facebook. Right? Like we're not gonna do the things that actually matter and are necessary unless we all act together to do that. Um, and we're going to see more and more things um, being defunded, right? We're going to see libraries being defunded because it is, it's, it's a, a democratic, in, in the most beautiful way of the demos, the people um, institution. We're going to see public schools being defunded because it's democratic, right? It, it is a communal thing. So this is something that you know, I wrestle with on a daily basis living here um, as a Floridian. And uh, I know that you're in Tallahassee and you, you are there wrestling with it too in larger and better ways too. Um, so thank you for doing that. I'm just in Gainesville, which is like my own little utopian community. <laughs> Very fair. Um, Michael is asking what all of the writers in the room is probably wondering, are you teaching any workshops right now? Oh, I, I lost you halfway through. I'm so sorry. Can you repeat? And so Michael is asking what all of the writers in the room is probably wondering, are you te teaching any workshops right now? <laughs> That's very sweet. Um, I do teach at Warren Wilson every two years, three years. I taught at Brand Love this past summer and it was such a glorious experience. It wasn't in person, of course, it wasn't on the mountain, it makes me sad. But it was um, just this little cohort of six per week and we loved each other and it was, it's, it's, I, I don't believe, okay, and forgive me if those of you are in MFA programs now, but I actually don't believe in the standard format of uh, a workshop. I think that it's hierarchical and I think that it's um, silencing the artists is the worst possible thing you can do. So what we do is built on Jesse Ball's um, in pedagogical inquiries about Quaker meetings, basically um, Quaker reconciliation. And so what we do is um, we put the author and the story um, and we try to, at the center, and we try to reconcile the story and the author. So we ask the author um, open-ended, non-judgmental questions. And I have to tell you, half the people who've gone through these processes with me in the past have cried because it's so vulnerable, right? To suddenly like see your work and yourself and try to struggle in public to, to come to an understanding of each other. It's, it's like, it's a very beautiful thing. It's very lovely. Um, all this to say, yeah, when I do teach, it's either like a Tin House or a Bread Love and Warren Wilson every two or the three years. That's, Warren Wilson is an MFA program. Just I love that. That's such like a unique yeah. workshop method. Um, Workshop can always be very like tender and vulnerable. So that's such a great way to do that. I love that. Um, let's it's see. wonderful. What we have is you mentioned your two children. Do they know that you're a famous writer? Do other than <laughs> write as well? <laughs> um, they, well, they know I'm neurotic. Um, they know I read a lot of books. Uh, <laughs> they, well, okay. So I think they know now because they've been to enough of my book events. Um, when Florida came out, I, my older son ran away because he was just humiliated. And my younger son came up to the microphone and actually took it out of my hand in order to start talking himself. This is who they are with their personalities. Um, yeah, they, they know. I think well, I've had to make a lot of compromises in order to live in Florida. <laughs> Um, but one of the things that is a really beautiful thing is that um, my husband and I have a contract, an actual physical contract. And those of you who are thinking about having children with a partner, it, I will talk to you through this process. It's wonderful. Um, but we have a contract. And part of the contract is I get to go on book tours. I get to go to residencies, right? I get to go and like do my thing that I need to do. And then when I come back to the family, I'm happy. And I think that... Um, children want their parents to be happy, right? They, they, want, they want their parents to feel fulfilled and ready to love them as deeply as they possibly can without resentment. Um, so uh, they know that I go away a lot. They know that I read too much. They know that I, um, 
I, I get angsty. Uh, and that's what I think they think a writer is, which is, they're not wrong. They're not wrong. <laughs> <laughs> well, we are nearing the end here. So I just want to um, open up the floor again for any last remarks from you, Lauren, or last remarks from you, Dale. Thank you for coming. Thank you all. I really, um, thank you for like bearing with my horrible Orlando hotel room. I appreciate you being here with me. Awesome. Well, thank you guys both again so much for your time and for such an amazing conversation. Uh, it was very inspiring, very fun to talk about this book. I'm so excited for all of your viewers who haven't read it yet to read it. It's amazing. Just finished it today. Uh, thank you viewers again for having us into your home via Zoom. We're so grateful for your support of Lauren, of Friends of the Library, and of Midtown Reader. Uh, once again, Matrix, as well as any of Lauren's other titles, for Florida, Fates and Furies, any of those are available um, to purchase online at Midtown reader or if you're local please stop by in store we would love to see you um, mass this of course but we would definitely love to see you so thank you all again and have a wonderful night um have a wonderful night lauren and dale thank you again you too thank, thank you, you. Thank you. It's good to see you thank you bye thank everyone. you lauren thanks Kristen. thank you dale <laughs> thanks